Hello everyone, great to be here again with members of um, U3A and thank you Nigel for the invitation to speak about the tarot. Before I start I'll just tell you about the title slide that's on your screen now. You can see that it's a scan of two pages from an illuminated manuscript, it's Italian, 16th century. The illustrations are depicting two of Francisco Petrarch's triumphs from a parade. On the left, it's depicting love. You can see Cupid there shooting his arrows at the heart of the lady that's kneeling there in a white robe. And on the right is Chastity, where the lady is now standing and Cupid is sitting staring straight ahead. No bow, no arrows. More to come about Petrarch's triumphs later on in this presentation. When I started putting together this presentation, I knew very little about the tarot, to be honest. Um, I do own a couple of decks. They were bought out of curiosity, really. The first deck I bought, known as the Gilded Tarot, came with a book called Easy Tarot Handbook, on the same level as Tarot for Dummies kind of thing. I look at them from time to time and I've had a go at dealing out the cards and interpreting the meanings. Uh, but with me not really knowing what I'm doing, I found it all a little bit too complicated. <laughs> Looking at each card, then reading the book. Um, but the illustrations are quite beautiful though, always detailed and full of symbolism. I find it all very interesting. I'm sure you'll all agree that it's not uncommon for most people to think of tarot cards being associated with the paranormal magic, astrology and fortune telling. For many of us, a tarot card reading brings to mind a woman, usually a veiled gypsy lady at a fair, in flowing robes, leaning over a small candlelit table, foretelling of impending doom, and the cards drawn are always the hangman and death card, and then asking us for money, for frightening us hard to death. It's our own fault really, we can't resist wondering what the future holds for us. Everyone wants to time travel, don't they? Uh, we are familiar with this scenario. It isn't unexpected and most probably due to the film and TV industry. We've had to take into consideration that over the last hundred years, film and TV has demonized and perpetuated the darker side of tarot reading. Suspense, drama and horror to spook the audience, it sells tickets. So I've looked into how all this came about and why we associate the tarot with fortune telling and the dark arts, all to be revealed throughout this presentation. There's a lot of friction between tarot historians and card readers about the origins and purpose of the tarot cards. The tarot deck of cards has a fascinating history, shrouded in mystery and supposition. Of course, my interest is always in art history. So firstly, I wanted to find out about the fantastic illustrations, who designed and painted them and why, and to place the artwork into historical context. Was the tarot relevant to the political, economic and social situation at the time? What do all these weird illustrations mean? These are the questions I've asked myself when researching, which by the way, I've done solely through the internet and it's been a bit of a slog to be honest that there's not much there um not many scholarly papers anyway uh, but i have managed to sidestep wikipedia um it's always tempting to use for information some of it's plausible but i can commend it for the images as they allow you to download for free um and they're high resolution and so very good quality anyway i've done my best but firstly, a slight detour from the main deck of cards to a specific card, the Three of Cups. Three of Cups group is the name of a new friendship art and craft group based in Aberystwyth. Just a small group of like-minded people. It is a splinter group from Aberystwyth Friendship Group, which is in the process of winding down and will finish in April 2023. So when choosing the name for this new group, Margaret, our chair and I decided not to include the words friendship or aberystwyth. We just wanted to have a clean break from what had gone before. We wanted something quite different, quirky, catchy, unusual, but meaningful. We pondered. 
I looked at names of Celtic gods, goddesses, ancient Greek heroes, myths, legends, lots of things. And then I realised I probably wouldn't remember them and, well, I couldn't re pronounce half of them anyway. And then I noticed my box set of tarot cards. Ah, light bulb moment. What's the tarot card for friendship? So a general description from the Rider Waite deck. Um, the Three of Cups represents groups coming together to focus on an, a common emotional goal. People reach out emotionally to one another. It speaks of a sense of community and can indicate uh, the time to get more involved by helping. So just right, we both agreed. And this slide is showing some of the various designs of this one card, Three of Cups, and there are many. These are mostly modern designs that are dating back to the early 1900s. There are hundreds of different styles of the Three of Cups card made by artists and illustrators. So the card on the left is from the 1909 Rider Waite deck, the artist being Pamela Coleman Smith. And the one on the right completed in 2007, the Gilded Tarot, artwork by Chiro Marchetti. The Three of Cups tarot and whatever style usually includes the same ingredients, symbols. Always three women, usually young, holding golden cups in the air in a toast of celebration. Their expressions are joyful and they seem to be dancing around one another in a circle. They are enjoying their moment of happiness and success while they can. They wear flower wreaths on their heads, representing success and victory. Three women represent compassion, integrity and balance. So the meaning of the Three of Cups card varies slightly with every Google search, but generally the one I've chosen for the Three of Cups group web page and Facebook page seems to sum up the card well with a general well-balanced description of what it means. Or should I say interpreted as meaning? It's a flexible system, this interpreting of meanings. Also to take into consideration is how the card is pulled out of the deck and placed down to be interpreted. If placed upside down, um, it becomes the opposite of congeniality. Of course, our new group is going for the right way up. All the good stuff, not the reverse tarot meanings. We don't want any of that going on in our group. I do wonder where all this information came from, who interpreted the images and edited the meanings. So I've looked into the history. I'm afraid it's a bit sketchy, but I've done my best. Despite the lack of evidence to support the claim, some writers still believe tarot cards date back to ancient Egypt. Others think they're what's left of the only book to survive the burning of the Library of Alexandria. It is accepted now that the tarot cards were originally just playing cards. The earliest playing cards originated in China, dating back to the Tang Dynasty. That's 618 to 907 AD when the Chinese played with card tiles made of bone or ivory as an alternative to dominoes, chess, my young and dice games. With the invention of paper in the 12th century, the Chinese began shuffling and dealing cards made with a heavy paper containing symbols like bamboo, buttons, queens and numbers. From China, playing cards in this form reached Europe around 1360 not directly from China, but through Egypt. The history of um, suit marks demonstrates a fascinating interplay between words, shapes and concepts. The original suits were goblets, gold coins, swords and polo sticks. Polo being then unknown in Europe, these were transformed into battens or staves, which together with swords, cups and coins, are still the traditional suit marks of Italian and Spanish cards used today. Other modern decks, including the most universally popular Rider Waite deck, vary slightly by moving from staves to wands, coins to pentangles, but swords and cups stay the same. 
Um, this is an early 15th century Italian fresco here showing people playing cards, possibly playing with a tarot deck, as the tarot, tarot was invented at this time in Italy. The basic deck of cards was enhanced by adding 22 illustrated trump cards. This was the fifth suit of 21 plus an odd card called Il Matto, Italian for the Fool. These were specially illustrated cards called Triomphi, Italian for Triumphs. A tarot deck consists of 78 cards. The four suits set of 56 cards is known as the Minor Arcana and the 21 illustrated trump cards plus the Fool card are known as the Major Arcana. The word arcanum, pluralised as arcana, came from Latin arcanus, meaning secret, and entered English as the Dark Ages gave way to the Renaissance. It was often used in reference to the mysteries of the physical and spiritual worlds, subjects of heavy scrutiny and rethinking at the time. The cards were originally unnumbered, so that it was necessary to remember what order they went in. There is no proof that Triumphi were originally produced independently of the standard deck of playing cards, but their function when added to the pack was to act as a suit superior in power to the other four, a suit of triumphs or trumps. So the illustrated trump cards were made to serve as a permanent suit for a game called Triumphi, trumps. Card designers illustrated this suit with animals, flowers, hunting scenes or moral allegories. Each card bore a different allegorical illustration instead of a common suit mark. Such illustrations probably represented characters in medieval reenactments of Roman triumphal processions, similar to floats in a modern festival parade. This is death, one of the key figures in these triumphs. Note it represents a float in a procession with a cart being pulled along by yoked oxen. It has some resemblance to the death card in a modern tarot deck with the Grim Reaper being the main focus. Here's another death triumph image. When they look not for me at all, with sudden stroke I make them down to fall. And that's from a 14th century poem uh, the Triumphs, written by Francisco Petrarch. The translation from Italian to English was made by a member of the court of Henry VIII. It took him, Francesco Petrarch, 30 years to write his series of poems, which were arranged in triumphs as one thing over another. Petrarch's triumphs worked like this. Chastity trumps love, death trumps chastity, while fame trumps death, as you'll s still be known even though you're gone. But then in time, fame fades, so time trumps fame. Divinity trumps time. These are all reflected in one way or another in the 22 cards of the major arcana of the tarot. And here they are, illustrated in this illuminated manuscript from the 15th century by Apolliano di Giovanni di Tommaso. Gosh, I hope I've pronounced that correctly. And this first one, this is love. Chastity. Death. Fame. Time. Eternity. Moving on now um, to look at other uh, card decks made around this time. The famous Visconti Sforza Tarot is used collectively to refer to incomplete sets of approximately 15 decks from the middle of the 15th century, now located in various museums, libraries and private collections around the world. No complete deck has survived. The decks all date to around 1441 and the artwork uh, attributed to the workshop of Banif Bonifacio Bembo, excuse my um, <laughs> interpretation of Italian, from 1441 
Francesco Sforza, a mercenary commander, served in both Milan and Venice and married the only child of Filippo Maria Visconti. We don't know if the deck was invented by Duke Filippo Maria Visconti or simply crafted, crafted for him. Some of the symbolism pictured in these cards were undoubtedly heraldic emblems that belonged to the Visconti and Sforza families. In the Visconti Sforza Tarot, the highest trump is the world, followed by the angels. Then in descending order, you have the sun and the moon, star, temperance, death, traitor, old man, wheel of fortune, fortitude, chariots, justice, love, pope, emperor, papers, empress, mountebank, and lastly, fool. The older pack diverges slightly from the standard as it has many as six court cards per suit, including a male and female of all ranks. In addition to the more usual trumps, it also includes three theological virtues. So here we have faith, hope and charity. It's uncertain if this pack was uniquely structured or if it represents an earlier stage before the tarots were standardised. The Visconti Sforza deck was thought to be inspired by the costume figures who participated in carnival parades, as they do today. When I googled Visconti Sforza Tarot for information, Amazon and Etsy kept coming up suggesting that I buy a complete replica set. It looks very appealing today, as it probably was back then. Imagine playing cards with these, but you'd have to have a good memory to remember which card trumps which. Getting into that mindset of an early 15th century card player in Italy, probably, you know, impossible, I'd say. <laughs> but they do look very, very nice. The Solar Busca Tarot is also from the 15th century, with 78 cards in the deck. When I searched for information of who the artist was, I found very little information. Although some believe that Nicola de Maestro Antonio de Acona was one of the most eccentric painters of the Renaissance and may have been the artist behind the Solar Busca desk deck. Although the arguments are not entirely convincing, it is by no means certain, but it has been alleged that the deck was commissioned to honour Alfonso d'Est on the occasion of his wedding to Anna Sforza, granddaughter of Bianca Maria Visconti. All the 56 playing card suits cards are illustrated, but it differs greatly from the other decks of this era. As the trump card illustrations deviate from the classic tarot iconography, unlike the earlier Visconti Sforza tarot decks, the cards of the Solar Busca are numbered. The trump cards have Roman numerals, while the pips on the plain suits have Hindu Arabic numeral numerals. I haven't found any reference to what trumps what. It was engraved into metal in the late 15th century. Cards illustrate a colourful procession of ancient Greek and Roman heroes, armoured in the style of the late 15th century northern Italy. They bear bagpipes, shields, lyres, pennants, staffs and torches, while accompanied by basilics, crows, falcons, doves and eagles, and every single card is a miniature drama. The expressions of the highly individualised figures inviting us to speculate like the tarot itself, on the past and future of this cryptic world. Considered the oldest complete 78 card tarot deck in existence, the Solar Busca, named for the family of Milanese nobles who owned it for some five generations. Here are some examples I picked at random from Wikipedia. Very strange illustrations, but beautifully executed. 
Here we have examples, Three of Cups on the left and the Fool on the right. It is the earliest known tarot deck that illustrates the major and minor trumps in the way that has become the standard with characters and objects depicting allegorical scenes today. In the Renaissance era, this would have been revolutionary. A single complete hand-painted deck is known to exist, along with 35 uncoloured cards held by various museums around the world. And as with the Visconti Sforza decks, you can also buy the Solar Busker on Amazon and other outlets. When I googled it, this, this came up. <laughs> So here's another example of the Italian 15th century trump cards. I haven't been able to find out much about these. They just turned up on a search in Google. You can see here the hermit on the left and the lovers with Cupid, Cupid shooting arrows on the right. The moon, the hangman and death. So we've established that the earliest references to tarot all date back to the 1440s and around 1450 and fall within the quadrilateral defined by the northern cities of Italy, Venice, Milan, Florence and Urbino. Because of the complicated nature of the game, by that point it is likely that it had begun evolving earlier in the century. The iconography that we've just seen firmly in place by around the year 1500. This slide showing an uncut carry sheet from Milan in about around 1500. People use these Trivanti decks to play Triumph, um, a card game with similarities to bridge. During the early 1500s, the word Triumphi disappears and the card, cards get a new name, Tarocci. The game travelled to other parts of Europe and in 1736, Chanson of Marseille created a new deck, a prototype for the later Tarot de Marseille decks. And here it is. The Tarot de Marseille became the standard deck built by French and Swiss card manufacturers from around 1700 and probably took its definitive form near the beginning of the 17th century. Original cards from the tarot deck of Jean Dodal of Lyon, a classic tarot of Marseille's deck, which dates from 1701 to 1750. Here we have the chariot, the moon, the world. The earliest surviving cards of the Marseille pattern were produced by Jean Noble of Paris around 1650. The first modern tarot de Marseille that we know of was printed by Pierre Madeine of Dijon in 1709. This deck was nearly identical to its precursors, the Noble and Dodal. Here we have Death, the Devil and the Hangman. Original cards from the tarot deck of Jean Dodal of Lyon, a classic tarot of Marseille's deck which dates from 1701 to 1715. In 1736, Chasson of Marseille printed what was to become the prototype for most later decks. By the mid 1700s, decks nearly identical to Chasson's were being produced in France, Belgium and Switzerland. Chasson's deck became the mother of all contemporary tarot decks in 1760 when Nicolas Convert of Marseille copied a Chasson deck directly onto his wood blocks, and this became the standard deck in France and is the model for most of the popular decks used today. Again, you can buy this tarot deck on Amazon and other outlets. The design now crisp in comparison with today's decks. You can see here examples of uh, the Fool, how it changes from the 1700s through the 1800s to the card we find today. And the Fool is not the origin of the modern Joker. Uh, it was invented in the late 19th century as an unsuited Jack in the game of Euchre. That's spelt E-U-C-H-R. 
So from a card game of trumps to something more, what happened to transform the deck of playing cards into a vehicle to be used by occultist and fortune tellers? In 1773, an essay was published from a book called The Primeval World, Analysed and Compared to the Modern World, written by former Protestant pastor and Freemason Antoine Court de Gabellin. In his essay, he proposed the theory that tarot cards came from Egypt and contained the secret wisdom of Thoth, the god of writing, magic, wisdom and the moon. It was his immediate perception, the first time he saw the tarot deck, that it held the secrets of the Egyptians and writing without the benefit of Champollion's deciphering of the Egyptian language, Court de Gabellin developed a reconstruction of tarot history without producing any historical evidence, which was that Egyptian priests had distilled the ancient book of Thoth into these images. That is the first instance we have of that theory. It is a common theme still to this day. And just to be clear, there is nothing in ancient Egyptian art that looks like the tarot in any definable or obvious way. No tarot decks have been found among the tombs of the pharaohs. But there were others to follow in his footsteps. I'm just going to mention their names with a brief description here as this presentation could go, go on for far too long and get far too complicated. Um, and they're all associating the tarot with ancient Egypt and the occult. So here we have Jean-Baptiste Alliet, a seed merchant, writing under the pseudonym Atelier, popularised tarot divination. He was the French occultist and tarot researcher. Eliphas Levi, author and former Catholic priest, was a French esotericist, poet, a reputed ceremonial magician and author of more than 20 books on magic, Kabbalah, alchemical studies and occultism. He was perhaps the most important figure in the history of tarot in France and was largely responsible for the subsequent association of tarot with esotericism. He popularised the notion that tarot symbols were somehow connected with the Hebrew alphabet and, and thus to the Jewish mystical tradition of Kabbalah. And this is the form of the earliest alphabet invented by the Canaanites and the Phoenicians sometime around 1500 BC at the end of the Bronze Age. It is the ancestor of all alphabets around the world and in one of his books he wrote this. The 22 keys of the tarot are the 22 letters of the Kabbalistic primordial alphabet. By 22 keys, he meant the trump cards. Kabbalists and mystics of Judaism considered these 22 letters to be mystical for contemplation and meditation. He wrote that these letters were somehow related to the tarot. This book is on sale today. It is a compilation of Levi's writings on the 22 major arcana of the tarot and their corresponding Hebrew letters. Much of the tarot imageries we see today come from the ignorance of French occultists linking Egypt and the Hebrew language to spiritualism. Uh, Joseph Paul Oswald Worth, uh, he was a Swiss occultist, artist and author. He studied esotericism and symbolism and in 1889, he created the first occult tarot deck in history, known as the Arcanes de Tarot Kabbalistique. It consisted only of the 22 major arcana cards. And while he followed the designs of the Tarot de Marseille closely, he introduced several alterations, incorporating extant occult symbolism into the cards. Gerard Anciet Vincent Ancus, whose pseudonym was Papas, was a Spanish-born French physician, hypnotist, 
and popularizer of occultism. He founded the modern Martinist order. He studied the Kabbalah, occult, tarot, magic and alchemy, and the writings of Eliphas Levi. Samuel Liddell McGregor Mathers was a British occultist, a translator by trade, and also associated with esotericism, ritual magic and divination, along with Eliphas Levi and Gerard Ancos, he incorporated the tarot trumps into a complex system of correspondences, linking them to the zodiacal signs, the Hebrew alphabet and all manner of esoteric schemes. He is well known as one of the founders of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. You might well be in this photo, members of the Victorian Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, and it looks like they're having a seance. In England, occultism was also gaining wide resonance. Initially, tarot played no part, but it soon became a key element of this environment. This happened under the influence of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. Golden Dawn was founded in 1888 and its rituals are described in the mysterious cipher manuscript. Incorporated into its teachings were most of the currents that constituted the occult worldview, including Freemasonry, Egyptian magic, Hermeticism, Celtic Renaissance, and Christian mysticism. All these traditions found expression in the tarot symbolism, but its correspondence of tarot trumps with the pathways of the tree of life would form the basis of the most modern forms of divination interpretation. It was used both as part of magical practice and as a divinatory device. Golden Dawn initiates believe that tarot could not only be used to foretell the future, it could also affect it, and we're obliged to keep this knowledge secret. And yes, you can buy this book on Amazon and other outlets. The original account of the teachings, rites and ceremonies of the Hermetic Order of the, of the Golden Dawn. The Victorians were haunted by the supernatural, by ghosts, fairies, table wrappings and the telepathic encounters. Occult religions and the idea of reincarnation, visions of the other world and a reality beyond the other the everyday. So it comes as no surprise that during the late 1800s, card reading, crystal gazing, palmistry and other forms of fortune telling were also very popular. They were especially obsessed with spiritualism and contacting the dead. Also during this time, the growth of religious scepticism led to an increased rejection of orthodox religion by Freemasons, occult enthusiasts and followers of Hermeticism, who searched for salvation by other means, including occultism. Fortune telling and divination with playing cards was both a harmless parlour game and a profitable criminal enterprise. It seems then it was not only by coincidence that a new deck of cards was created that perfectly matched this dalliance into the occult and supernatural during this time. In 1908, a tailor-made modern looking tarot deck was created by Arthur Edward Waite. Waite was a British poet and scholarly mystic who wrote extensively on occult and esoteric matters. He was raised a Catholic and made a living from translating writing and reviewing books on occult topics. In 1891, at the age of 34, he, he entered the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. He was the order's 99th initiate, but soon left only to rejoin in 1896. But dissatisfied, he eventually started his own group, Order of the Independent and Rectified Right. In 1909, he hired Pamela Coleman Smith to illustrate the deck, which came to be known as the Rider Weight Deck because it was published by the Rider Company. Pamela Coleman Smith drew inspiration 
and for nearly a dozen cards, the exact imagery from the solar busker desk, black and white photographs of which were exhibited at the British Museum. The solar busker tarot. Just as example, the three of swords from the solar busker and rider weight decks, very similar. In the rider weight deck, every popular, very popular, catering to a modern taste and giving importance to esoteric practices. The, the Christ and Christian imagery of previous decks was toned down. So the minor arcana was illustrated with allegorical scenes where earlier decks had only had simple designs. Uh, for instance, the Pope became the Hierophant. I had to look up Hierophant in the dictionary. Definition is an official high priest of religious mysteries, a person who interprets and explains esoteric mysteries. In the tarot guide, the Hierophant Fant, sorry, can represent a counsellor or mentor who will provide you with wisdom, guidance, or a spiritual or religious advisor. The card here showing the Pope is from the, the Visconti Sforza deck. And the Papist became the High Priestess. The Minor Arcana was illustrated with allegorical scenes where earlier decks only had simple designs. However, general compositions for the major arcana remain unchanged. For example here, the Knight of Cups card is distinct in terms of colour, scheme and decorative details. The three cards for comparison here are Visconti Sforza, Marseille and Rider Waite. And here is, as example, we have the Empress, again from the Visconti Sforza Marseille and Rider Waite decks. Um, it is intriguing to compare these renditions because they have such different artistic styles. Uh, it came as no surprise to me to find out that members of the Surrealist movement took an interest in the tarot. The Marseille tarot is reinterpreted during the late 1930s by Surrealist artist and writer André Breton and his artist friends Wilfredo Lam. Max Ernst, Jacqueline Lambert, Oscar Dominguez, uh, Victor Brauner, Jacques Herold, André Masson and Frédéric Delanglade. This came about while they were stranded in the French port along with many other artists, writers and intellectuals attempting to escape Nazi occupied Europe and gain passage to America. The creation of the card deck became a way of passing the time during several months of anxious waiting. This tarot deck was no ordinary deck of cards. The Jeu de Marseille, which translates to Game of Marseille, was a variation on the traditional Marseille deck, with the figures supplanted by heroes of the Surrealist movement as drawn by the Surrealists themselves. Like all Surrealist creations, the card deck was an amalgam of art, mysticism and shameless self-promotion. Typically for a group that had already spent a decade analysing and deconstructing all available artistic media, it wasn't enough to merely redecorate an existing pack of cards. Breton wanted a thorough reinvention along Surrealist principles. Even though the number of cards was kept at 52, this highly symbolic structure places the card deck closer to the tarot arrangement of ones, cups, swords and discs, rather than the usual clubs, hearts, spades and diamonds. Breton's socialist sympathies meant that having a royal hierarchy of king and queen lording it over a humble jack was quite unacceptable. These were subsequently renamed Genius, Siren and Magus. Again, that the name Magus here is interesting for the added occult reference it gives to the design. So the traditional suits were renamed accordingly. Flames, which were red for love and desire. Flames, Ace, Genius, Charles Baudelaire, 
French poet and art critic, Siren, Mariana, Alcafado, Portuguese nun, Magus, novelist, George Philip Frederick Freya von Hardenberg, pen name Novalis, was a German polymath writer, philosopher, poet, aristocrat and mystic. Stars, Black for Dreams, Ace, which was the Ace, Genius, Lautremont, Comte de Lautremont was the nom de plume of Isidore Lucien Ducasse, a French poet born in Uruguay, who had a major influence on modern arts and literature. Siren, Alice from Alice in Wonderland, Lewis Carroll's book. Magus Freud, Sigmund Freud was an Austrian neurologist and the founder of psychoanalysis. Wheels Red for Revolution. Genius de Sade, Donation Alphonse Francois, the Marquis de Sade, French nobleman, revolutionary politician, philosopher and writer, famous for his literary depictions of libertine sexuality and erotic works depicting sexual fantasies with an emphasis on violence and suffering. Depraved monster, jailed following number, numerous accusations of sex crimes. Siren is Lamiel, the name of a costume drama set in the 19th century from the author Stendhal. Magus is Pancho Villa. General Francisco Pancho Villa joined the Mexican Revolution in 1909. And finally, Locke's Black for Knowledge. Genius Hegel, who was George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, was a German philosopher. Siren Helene Smith. Helene Smith was a famous late 19th century French medium. She was known as the muse of autism automatic writing by the Surrealist. Magus is Paracelus. Paracelus born Theophratus von Honheim was a Swiss physician, alchemist, lay theologian and philosopher of the German Renaissance. And finally the Joker Pa Ubu, mythical and at times ludic figure created by French playwright Alfred Cheney in his 1896 performance play called Ubo Roy. Another surrealist, I'm mentioning uh, Mary Leona Carrington here, British-born Mexican artist, surrealist painter and novelist, as she was featured in the Guardian newspaper just before Christmas. Uh, the article was about a widely expanded edition of the Tarot of Leon, Leonora Carrington. Um, that will place her tarot in the context of her wider career. She was highly regarded by peers such as Andre Breton, although long overlooked by the art establishment. She lived most of her adult life in Mexico City and was one of the last surviving participants of the Surrealist movement of the 1930s. In 1936, Carrington saw the work of German Surrealist Max Ernst in the International Surrealist Exhibition in London and was attracted to the artist before she even met him. Uh, but then she met him in the late 1930s. He left his wife and the couple moved to France together where she became part of the Surrealist circle around Breton. They formed a relationship and moved in together in Paris where Ernst prom promptly separated from his wife. And the, she created her own tarot in 1955 and the hand painting archetypes of the 22 major arcana. The tarot deck is an attractive subject matter for artistic, artistic interpretation that invites an intuitive understanding of life pared down to one moment. For example, here we have the Wheel of Fortune. Uh, strength and the sun. Another surreally, surrealist artist, Salvador Dali, produced a 78 tarot deck, Tarot Universal Dali. 
it was completed in the 1970s during the rise of the New Age movement. For his deck, Dali created new artworks for each card, nearly 90% of which were made by drawing or painting over and collaging existing masterpieces. He didn't make any new symbols or signs. For example, on the Four of Swords, the figure of Jean-Paul Marat, painted by Jacques-Louis David in The Death of Marat, is extracted from his surroundings, placed against an eggshell white background, and his limp, lifeless hand now seems to hold a blade of a blue and white sword, while three more stand behind him. Queen of Cups mixes references from both antiquity and modernity. A cartoonish yellow crown on the head of Francois Clouet's Elizabeth of Austria, Queen of France, around 1571. Her right hand resting on a matching goblet. Three trans semi transparent strokes of blue were then used to add a moustache and goatee to her face, a nod to Marshal de Champ's Luke of 1919 which he added the same facial features to the Mona Lisa. On the cards, the magician and the empress, Dali and his wife, Gala, are transformed into the two titular figures. They are holding or constituting a purely formal position or title without any real authority. When it comes to reading cards with the tarot universe, Dale, such references make it clear that reality and therefore one's identity is never fixed. In addition to her historical art references, there are also recurring motifs to be found throughout the deck. One, butterflies, traditionally representative of the psyche. Two, human figures, though shadowy, can be seen as ghostly reassertions of the specific cards focal points and three crutches which Dali apparently believed represented death, snobbery and discomfort in old age. Uh, Dali used the crutch to symbolise the need for emotional and physical support of various parts of one's life and in the tarot they had a double meaning representing the dualism of consciousness and unconsciousness as well as of inner and outer worlds. So the Surrealists believed in the magic they invoked. Breton, who led the movement with totalitarian zeal, took the subject seriously. His embrace of magic seems to have been calculated under the pretense of civilization and progress. Uh, we have managed to banish from the mind everything that might right or wrongly be termed superstition or fancy he wrote in the first surrealist manifesto taking up magic was a powerful way of challenging the society he despised and it became with a spectacular bag of tricks that could be used to shock and awe the bourgeoisie but at the same time the surrealists were exploring the mysticism Carl Jung was looking at the psychological value, pioneering its value, which was to become intrinsically linked to mental health and well-being in the 21st century. All through the years of the 19th, 20th centuries, tarot cards were being used by most people for entertainment or a reading by a psychic for fortune telling. Following the First and then the Second World War, Tarot cards began gaining a very different reputation as being an alternative useful tool in the field of psychotherapy, found to be especially useful when helping war veterans suffering from shell shock, post-traumatic stress disorder, to come to terms with the horrors they had encountered during their service in the forces. But really, tarot cards have always had deep roots in psychological applications and the world famous psychoanalyst Carl Jung first spoke publicly about tarot during a seminar in 1933, where he explained that the cards were making an easy way to re represent archetypes of mankind or universal traits like strength, ambition and passion in psychology, making them ideal tools for therapy and mental health. 
Among Jungians, the study of divination system, such as the I Ching, astrology and the tarot, is considered just another aspect, the study of the mind. Using tarot in psychotherapy, uh, tarot cards can provide a fresh perspective to a situation, harness the power of metaphor. Using tarot cards in a session is empowering to the client. They're a unique way to tap experience. Um, and of course, tarot cards are neutral. So for decades, the psychology field has employed tests that utilise ambiguous visual images to reveal underlying unconscious or difficult to communicate needs, beliefs and response patterns in patients. The Rorschach test, a set of ink blot images, for example, was originally developed to assess patients for schizophrenia, but is now more commonly used to explore individual perceptions and psychological processes. The thematic a perception test, more popularly known as the picture interpretation technique, includes a set of um, ambiguous and evocative images depicting a range of human scenarios and asks the test takers uh, to tell stories about what's being portrayed in the illustration. Both tests are designed to explore personality dynamics in the patient and better understand their motivations, beliefs and inner conflicts. So just like the Rorschach and the thematic apperception test, a set of classic tarot cards portrays ambiguous Im images of humans in a wide range of situations. Though tarot cards do not function in quite the same way as projective testing methods, when the cards are used correctly, they can help to better understand the patients and help them to better understand themselves. When the mystical goes mainstream, how tarot became a self-care phenomenon. A headline from the Guardian um, newspaper, October 2021. This is an excerpt from that article. Tarot is among a range of mystic practices to have seen a mainstream resurgence in recent years. In 2018, the Pew Research Center found that six in 10 Americans, both with re religious affiliations and not, held at least one New Age belief. Among the explanations given have been the internet connecting subcultures and people with alternative views, fashion houses bringing their imagery to the fore, and the decline in Christianity and community in the West. Above all, this new dawn of the New Age has been framed as a response to widespread anxiety and socio-political instability as an attempt to find meaning in an impervious chaotic world. I haven't found any statistics for the UK but I'm guessing it's a similar situation. So getting back to the different types of cards you can now purchase, over the last 50 years or so many variations on the theme of the tarot have emerged. So many decks to choose from. many variations. A good friend of mine bought me a Star Trek deck for Christmas. It's a fascinating mystical sci-fi view of the future. I'm enjoying looking at them. There's even a Christmas tarot deck. They're beautifully illustrated. Sentimental images with a nod to Victorian occultism. So we've arrived at the last slide in this presentation. Tarot from card game to fortune telling, surrealism, psychoanalysis, Christmas presents and comic con collectibles. It is established in our culture alongside astrology, interpreting dreams and other such similar practices. And I just wanted to round things up by saying that I remember tarot card reading being taken very seriously through the 1970s. Those flower power days when all things magical and mystical were being explored in the UK, we can't underestimate the influence of the Beatles going to India, transcendental messages from every direction, or so it seemed. Although the tarot still has a reputation of being for the new age hippie, 
who delves into the stuff of magic and make-believe, I think it is a valuable, elegant and sophisticated way to help relieve stress and anxiety by reaching into the subconscious in a way that perhaps other more conventional systems possibly fail. And that's it for now. Thank you for your time and thank you for listening. Any questions or comments?